Hey guys, Paul D coming to you live. This is day 10 of our 31 day challenge and I want to talk to you today about Millennial Madness, 50 Shades of Grey. I'm going to ask you to take off your rose colored glasses because today the duty hits the fan. This is the big day. This is where it all comes unglued right now in Proverbs chapter 10. We're on a 31 day challenge to look at the Proverbs, one a day for 31 days. And today is where the rubber meets the road. Today's the hardcore stuff. Today is where it really kicks in and it really ramps up. So day 10, we are one third of the way through the month of January. And I hope you've been taking this time to look at these Proverbs. And why am I calling this millennial medicine, millennial madness? Why does the duty hit the fan? Why does, the, why, does, why does it happen that way today? Because here for the first time, we're going to see in Proverbs chapter 10, a contrast between the wicked and the righteous, which of course brings us to the, to the huge proposition that wickedness exists and that righteousness exists, that we live in a world of good and evil, okay? It is not 50 shades of gray. It doesn't work that way. And the world for 4,000 years of recorded human history has thought in terms of good and evil, okay? It's only today, it's only the recent popular invention of relativism that has said, you know, I have my truth, you have your truth, all things are sort of neutral, all things are equal, but that has not been a predominant worldview. Has it existed? Yes, it's always existed, but as a predominant worldview, as an overarching theme that's taken society as a whole by storm, that our chief flag that we wave in this millennial madness is judge not, lest you be judged, right? That's a favorite Bible verse that we all like to see. Well, listen, you are not going to get any further in the Proverbs unless you accept this proposition that wickedness and evil exist. And they are both two forces to be reckoned with. And the sooner you take off your rose-colored glasses, the sooner you embrace the wickedness and the goodness, and viewing life not in 50 shades of gray, but in black and white. Does that mean everything's black and white and everything's simple? Absolutely not. You know, life is complex. Morality and figuring out morality and applying morality to our lives is a hugely complex process. But we need to understand that morality exists. So that is point number one. And let me illustrate point number one. How do we know that morality exists? Okay, first of all, you go out and lock your car. When you're out driving around, you go to the store, you pull in the parking lot, do you get out and lock your car? Why do you lock your car? Because you don't want your stuff to get stolen, right? Pretty simple, pretty basic, okay? My kid drove into a major city, parked to get out and look at a monument in the city, came back, his window was smashed out and his laptop was gone, okay? And his camera, okay? That was a horrible thing. Would you want your laptop and your camera stolen? No, we all get that. We all get that it's wrong to steal. We all make moral decisions every day. When you push that button down in your car and you lock your car, you're saying to the world that I'm voting in favor of morality. I'm saying stealing is wrong and stealing from me is wrong. Okay? So that's a huge point that we need to understand as we illustrate that good and evil exist and we make moral decisions every single day of our lives. And so when we say, hey, you right-wing people who are drawing this line, that's crazy. No, we all draw lines. The question is, where do we draw the line? Okay, the second point I wanna raise here is where does morality come from? Okay, first of all, morality comes from God. God is the ultimate source. He's the ultimate standard of all that is good. The very definition of God is he is absolute goodness. In him, goodness exists. We have relative goodness here on earth. As we look at things, we compare ourselves to things and we look at stuff, but ultimately goodness exists in God, okay? He, how, how does that communicate to us? Well, several things. First of all, God committed to, communicated to us through the Old Testament, through the revelation of himself in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments, a great uh, revelation to us of morality, of what is moral and what is good. So there was the Ten Commandments. And of course, you know, by way of extension, the entire Hebrew law, the Torah, the first five books of the, of the Old Testament that teach us in very detailed ways about what God values, what he, what he appreciates, what he thinks is good, what he says about different things. And so we learn principles from those things. So that's one is the Old Testament. Number two is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came from heaven. He came down. He became a man. He walked the 
the earth and he showed us the Father. He showed us what was good. He taught so many things. We're going to look at those in a few minutes. But that's the second thing is Jesus Christ. The third thing is the Word of God. Okay, It is the recorded revelation of Jesus' words and the words of God through the apostles and you know all these people that wrote on behalf of God. And they are the recorded uh, record of God's morality to us and his stories and the things that he wants to teach us. Then the next thing is the human conscience. How does God reveal to us his moral code? Through our conscience. Our conscience tells us, hey, don't do that. That's wrong. We do something and we violate our conscience. And what do we try to do? We start talking to our conscience and we try to convince our conscience that what we've just done was not wrong, but it was right. And you know what? You can't do that. It's called rationalization. We begin to rationalize with our conscience. But the moment you start to rationalize with your conscience, you prove yourself wrong because you violated your conscience. Okay? So conscience isn't more of the internal subjective. The exterior God is the exterior word of God is more objective and it's transcendent, it's outside of us, it comes to us. Whereas the conscience is internal and it's more subjective and it's not infallible either because you know, people have broken consciences. But it is a way that God communicates to us morality. And the Bible does have a lot to say about conscience. And here's the third way that we understand, the fourth way that we understand morality, and that is through the Holy Spirit. That's right. God's Spirit is a restraining force in the world, the Scripture says. And it comes to us and it convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit teaches us what's right and wrong. And again, this is a subjective thing. Um, it is absolutely uh, he, because the Holy Spirit is a person, he's absolutely perfect in his judgments as he communicates to us. But we can close them off. We can shut them off. We can say, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to listen to that voice. Kind of like conscience. Holy Spirit is different than conscience. Conscience is part of our human makeup, but the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our conscience and through our spirit, and he is absolute um, righteousness, and he guides us and teaches us. So that's where some sources of where our morality come from. That's point two. Point one, morality exists. Point two, where do we get morality from? Those are four sources. Okay, I want to take a quick moment, and I want to illustrate this principle of morality. That morality exists, that absolute morality exists in the world today. And it's worth looking for. It's worth finding. It's worth investigating. It's worth it to read the Proverbs and say, hey, what does the Proverbs say about wickedness and about righteousness? And how can I apply this to my life? I gave up on fishing. I want to talk about fishing. I gave up on fishing because I said to myself, you know what? It's just not worth it. It's not worth taking my time and going out there and putting this line in the water to try to catch a fish. Because you know what? I really never caught too many fish. I didn't find it to be a very productive thing. I found it to be kind of a frustrating experience because I was out there trying to catch fish. I really didn't know too much about fishing. And as much as I love looking at the trees and the mountains and the water and, and, and all these things, I was never very productive at catching fish. So I said this, you know what? I'm giving up on fishing. It's just not worth it. In fact, I began to think, you know what? Maybe there's not even that many fish out there in the water. Hardly any at all, in fact. As much times I've been over this lake and fished all the different corners of it, and I haven't caught anything. I've tried all different baits, and you know what? It's worthless. It's a worthless endeavor to go fishing. And I don't think there's really any fish in the lake. But here's something that in the back of my mind told me that that, that wasn't true. Because every once in a while, some friends of mine would go fishing and they would catch a bunch of fish, okay? And I have this one friend in particular who went up to Rainy Lake up there, and he caught some five-foot-long fish, and how cool it was to see him holding up these five-feet-long fish. I'm like, that is super cool, and it made me realize that, hey, you know what? There are fish in that lake out there, and sometimes it is worth going fishing, and I just have to admit that I just really know nothing about fishing, okay? And there are people that know a lot, and that's how it is about morality, okay? We're going to the Word of God. We're going to the Proverbs, and we're going to jump into something here that maybe we don't know a lot about, okay? But we can't throw the baby out in the bathwater and say, you know, it's not worth it. I'm just going to accept this, you know, you don't judge me, and I don't judge you, and who are you to decide what's good and what's evil? Who are you to call something wicked? Here the Bible is going to call this wicked and that wicked, and this is good and that's good, and it's going to sit in judgment over a lot of behaviors, Okay, but if I'm going to go out there in my boat and I'm going to catch a fish and I'm going to have a great time, and I did, I went fishing with his buddy and we had a great time and we did catch some fish. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to enter out into the world of life, we have to say it's worth it. There are some things out there 
that are going to make a difference in our lives. And that's why I'm so excited about Proverbs chapter 10. There's so much more I want to say about this, but I'm going to leave it right there. Take off your rose-colored glasses. Embrace absolute truth. Shed the relativity and the relativism of 50 shades of gray and accept that God is a God of morality, a God of black and white moral truth and embrace the great catch that God has for you as you embrace his word. Thanks. Hope you're having a great time enjoying the Proverbs. Like and subscribe to this video. Share it if you felt it was helpful. And we'll look forward to talking to you tomorrow about some other exciting things in God. Follow Our hearts are set on your glory